Introduction to Metabolism, Part 2, Enzymes. In our last video, we looked at a simple equation like this, a simple reaction. We showed how we could describe it as being exergonic or energy releasing. We showed what it would look like on a potential energy diagram. And we used Gibbs free energy equation to determine that this reaction would be spontaneous. But what about a more complicated reaction, like this one, which you may recognize as aerobic respiration? If we look at this reaction, we may be deceived into thinking that glucose reacts with oxygen to make water and carbon dioxide while releasing energy in the production of ATP. However, you may recall that that's not really what happens. In fact, this is not one simple chemical reaction, but a complex series of reactions. As glucose is split during glycolysis into two pyruvate molecules, and then those two pyruvate molecules are converted to acetyl-CoA, which enter the Krebs cycle to finish the degradation. Along the way, high energy electrons are being stripped away to be sent down an electron transport channel for the chemiosmotic production of ATP, at the end of which the electrons are picked up by oxygen and finally we make water. But that's for another video and another day. What we see here is the overall reaction. Just what comes in and what goes out we don't see the steps or any of the intermediate products. What if this equation were an overall reaction and it had multiple steps? I'll keep it simple to make the point. In step one, let's say that molecule A with the addition of some energy is converted into a molecule I which represents the intermediate. And then in step two, the intermediate breaks down into B plus C and yields some energy. How does this equate to the overall reaction. Well, we can add these two equations just like you might add a math problem. We can line these two equations up just like we would a math problem and, and do the addition. We can just uh, we can just add straight down everything on this side of the arrow we add together and everything on this side. But to make this a little uh, easier and easier to follow, let's um, give this energy uh, these energy values. So on this side where we have energy, we're going to make this uh, 20, like 20 kilojoules. Uh, and on this side, we'll make this, say, uh, 80, just for the uh, sake of the math, make it easier. So if we add straight down, we have an A on this side, uh, plus an I, plus uh, 20 kilojoules. Um, using a new stylist here, and it's a little difficult. Uh, and then on the other side of the arrow, we have uh, another I. We have B whoops, uh, plus C, and we have plus 80 kilojoules. And so we can just add this together. And anything that's on both sides uh, of the arrow, we can eliminate. So I, the intermediate, shows up on both sides, so it goes away. We have 20 kilojoules, so we can subtract 20 kilojoules from this and get 60. And so that our overall equation is A yields B plus C plus energy, in this case uh, 60 kilojoules. Now let's put this equation on a potential energy diagram. If we just look at the overall equation, we know that it's an energy releasing equation, a uh, reaction, and it might look something like this. But if we look at the steps of the equation, we realize it's a little bit different picture. And so I'll pick a different color here. And in fact, in step one, we actually go up. It's an endergonic step to get to the intermediate. And then in step two, let me bring this down a little bit. In step two, we give off energy. And we end up in the same place. Uh, our change in energy, if we go across from beginning to the end, would be our value of 60. But it's a very different picture that we're seeing. A very, we're seeing the steps in step one uh, was an endergonic reaction, went up, and then the step two we drop back down. Now this energy uh, here that we have to go up, that we have to add to this equation, we call this the E sub A or the activation energy. That's the energy required to start this reaction. Now let's consider the time that the reaction takes if we're following time here. And let's compare two reactions. Here we have reaction one. We see that in reaction one, 
if we were to write it out and uh, write this equation what we were talk it out uh, in step one a goes to I the intermediate and then I breaks down to B plus C the overall reaction is exergonic we're starting up here at a and we're dropping down to uh, B and C which are our way down here so uh, we are going from here to here we see that that's a a release of energy uh, and we could write the reaction like this since I is made in one step and then consumed in the next our overall reaction is A yields B plus C plus energy if we look at reaction 2 the yellow line here we see that A plus W makes I and then I breaks apart into B plus C plus W and let's think about what's going on here the amount of energy that we uh, release here is the same we start at the same point and we end it at the same point if we go across here we can see that we're ending at the same point now that means that the energy component the reaction is the same and what about the overall reaction we have a making and w making i and then i being consumed in the next step but we also have w at the beginning and at the end so we don't include it in our overall equation so reaction two in overall view looks exactly like reaction one but when we look at the two reactions we see a very uh, big difference and the biggest difference is in this uh, initial hill that we have to go over this energy we have to put in uh, in order to get the energy out uh, and that's one aspect of what's going on here so re the reaction two requires less activation energy but the the um, the more interesting thing is because it requires less activation energy look at what happens with time we end we're finishing earlier because we don't have to put as much energy in to start the reaction so the advantage of reaction 2 over reaction 1 is that it happens faster so the question is how or why and we should also be asking ourselves what is W what is this substance that's there at the beginning and there at the end and because it's there this reaction occurs faster which brings us finally to enzymes enzymes are organic catalysts they're made of proteins so if we know an enzyme is an organic catalyst we need to ask ourselves what is a catalyst well a catalyst is any substance that speeds up the rate of a reaction by lowering the activation energy required without being consumed by the reaction the activation energy like we said before is the amount of energy needed to start a reaction so when we look back at this substance W is an enzyme its presence speeds up the rate of this reaction by lowering the amount of activation energy required now let's talk about our four enzyme rules the first one is enzymes do not make reactions happen they just make them happen faster so I have an analogy here we are at the mall and these people want to go from the first floor to the second floor the escalator is not making them go up but the escalator can make it happen faster it's a facilitator it makes happen what was already going to happen number two the same enzyme that works the forward reaction will catalyze the reverse reaction many react most reactions are reversible so whatever the uh, enzyme runs the forward reaction will also catalyze the reverse reaction my metaphor my analogy my mental picture of this is a revolving door this door doesn't care if you're coming in the building or out of the building it's gonna make it easier so one enzyme handles both of these arrows here third one enzymes are not consumed or permanently altered by the reaction now at first I had a hard time thinking up a, a metaphor and analogy for this and then it just struck me uh, I thought about a gymnast vaulting over uh, the vault here and the help that they get from the springboard so the springboard is there at the beginning and the springboard is there at the end now in the meantime it may be altered um, for a moment during the act of facilitating the reaction but it returns back to its its shape and in, at the end remains unaltered so that's my metaphor for that one finally our fourth rule enzymes are substrate specific they will only work for that reaction and for this we have the most commonly used metaphor or example used for enzymes and that's the idea of a lock and a key uh, the uh, the enzyme has a shape specific active site that fits a very specific substrate a different enzyme 
wouldn't work for this substrate. So this enzyme is specific for a very specific reaction. The specificity is based upon shape, and we know that enzymes are made of proteins, and proteins have very specific three-dimensional shapes, so there are many different enzymes uh, to service all the different reactions uh, as they fit the shape of their substrate, just like there would be many different keys for different locks. So we've answered what an enzyme does, speeds up the rate of reaction by lowering the amount of activation energy required, so we finish the reaction earlier, and we have learned four rules that we need to remember about how uh, enzymes uh, behave, but we still have one big question to answer, and that is, how does it do this job? How does an enzyme lower the amount of activation energy we need? And it turns out there are four ways. And we're going to look at each of those. Uh, enzymes can place bonds under stress, making them easier to break. They can create a template that orients molecules so they can bond easier. They, the active site of the enzyme could create a microenvironment that's more conducive to the reaction. And the enzyme can briefly become part of the reaction to make the participants more likely to react or more reactive. Let's look at each of those individually. When an enzyme helps break a molecule down, it often does so by facilitating uh, hydrolysis or cutting by water. And so the molecules, as they uh, attach to the shape-specific enzyme, can often, uh, the shape, when it, when it fits in there, it ca it's called induced fit. The enzyme actually slightly changes shape, and it could cause the, the, the substrate the, that it's acting on to make sh change shape a little bit, making it easier for water to get in here. Whereas before, water might have a hard time getting to that bond to cut it. We call that hydrolysis. By placing this bond under a little bit of stress, maybe kind of pulling the molecules back a little bit, that's how I think about it, now the water can get in there more easily and break that bond and help us digest that molecule. Now what about the opposite idea? If we're trying to put these two molecules together and they're moving around and randomly bump into each other, into each other and they'll only bond if they line up just right, and sometimes the enzyme acts as a template for these molecules to orient them so that they will, uh, as they line up and attach to the substrate, or to the active site of the enzyme, that will line them up so that the, their electrons will line up correctly, or their shape of the molecules will line up, so that we can create this bond and put that molecule together. Now our third way is that sometimes these molecules want to get together, but chemically they're just not, uh, they're not the conditions, the environment, the chemical conditions around these molecules are preventing them from bonding. Uh, and sometimes the active site of the, uh, of the enzyme, this space in here, can provide a little microenvironment that's different than the area out here. So maybe right down here in these little pockets of space, maybe it's slightly more acidic or more basic. And as a result, the molecules uh, will behave differently in this space and therefore become more reactive, whereas if they were out here, they'd have trouble making that chemical connection. And so this creates an environment, a little pocket of space that's different than out here uh, to facilitate that reaction. And finally, sometimes enzymes can, can become part of the reaction. In other words, this molecule can bind to the enzyme chemically, and we can form some kind of a, a bond. And when we make that bond, that changes how this molecule may be shaped and how, it, uh, how reactive it may be. And now it may be much more conducive uh, and able to bond to this molecule. And once these two molecules make a connection, um, we can then uh, release this bond that we had before. So the uh, enzyme for one moment is part of the reaction and then uh, moves away once it's facilitated the combining of these two molecules. Let's quickly look at a couple more ideas about enzymes. Here we have an enzyme and a substrate and we notice that this substrate's uh, the active site of the enzyme is not shaped in a way that fits the substrate. It just doesn't fit. It's not the right shape. But we also notice there's another site over here. This is called the allosteric binding site. Let's look at the word allosteric. Allosteric means other shape. Allo meaning other and steric meaning shape. And we have these other molecules that can bind into this, uh, this binding site. And when it does, it changes the shape of this enzyme's active site. And now the substrate can fit into the active site. We call this molecule an allosteric activator basically turns the enzyme into an on position by changing its shape to accept the substrate. We can say that this enzyme is inducible. It can be turned on. We also have the opposite idea where we have an allosteric inhibitor that when it plugs into this allosite, this allosteric binding site, 
it changes the shape of the active site such that it rejects the substrate. Now the active site no longer fits, so this enzyme was on until it was turned off. We say that this enzyme is repressible. We can turn it off through allosteric control, other shape, changing the shape of the active site uh, by plugging to an other receptor. Now very quickly I want to talk about this, we'll do more in class, about negative feedback and inhibition. Uh, it's very common in a series of reactions. We take a molecule A to B to C to D to a final product, and that each step is catalyzed by a different enzyme, that the final product made might inhibit one of the first steps of the reaction. But the question is, how does it inhibit? How do you inhibit an enzyme? Well, we have competitive inhibition and non-competitive. So we can compete for the active site. In this case, this molecule could come in and plug into the active site of this first enzyme, blocking the substrate from fitting, thus turning the system off here. In a non-competitive inhibition, we're not competing for the active site, but it's more of the allosteric control that we just looked at. By plugging into this other receptor, we change the shape of the active site and repress this enzyme. And finally, in class, we may talk a little bit more about this uh, coenzymes and cofactors, which are just what they sound like. These are things that help enzymes, that go along with enzymes. In this case, we see that this coenzyme helps make the shape of this active site uh, fit this substrate. And so coenzymes and cofactors just aid enzymes uh, in binding to their substrates. And we'll talk more about that in class. I hope this was helpful. Go back and, and review the parts that you need more work on, and we'll talk more about it in class.